Hello and welcome. My name is John Frazier. I am an assistant professor of humanities at the College of DuPage outside of Chicago, Illinois. Today I'd like to present to you a conversation, a pedagogical dialogue, about teaching Southern Mesopotamian art and culture. Twofold. One, how to get students involved, particularly undergraduate students, some that are art history majors, and then others more likely that are more general education, taking this as a general education part of their curriculum. The second part is how to explain to them kind of the differences between two different cultural time periods and how those cultural time periods impact our world all the way to the present day, particularly Sumer and Akkad, which we'll be talking about today. When I first go about teaching this, the question that I always like to pose when we introduce new cultural or historical time periods is the top question up here. Why do we care? Why should we study Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent? And so the first part is to make sure everyone understands where it is as we start to have this dialogue. Now, almost all the students have studied the Fertile Crescent and Mesopotamia in the past. And if I ask them and survey them, they'll be able to tell me, at least a few of them, the Fertile Crescent. They might not be sure where it is. The Middle East is about as close as most students can get. But then we start talking about kind of the Tigris, Euphrates River Valley that runs right through here. The idea of the Fertile Crescent being at the top, Mesopotamia. And today we're going to concentrate on Sumer here and Akkad. So I asked them again, why should we care about Mesopotamian art, Mesopotamian culture? And I will leave it up to them. I'll give them a, a moment or two to think about it. And then I'll pose the question, why are, there, why are there 60 minutes in an hour? Why are there 60 seconds in a minute? And invariably, some will say it has to do something with this culture. Not that they know, but because that's the information and the question that I'm asking for today. So we walk through the significance of these different features. And here are just a few of those significant features. The base mathematical 60 comes from ancient uh, Sumerian culture in particular, but Mesopotamian in large. They invented complex irrigation. This is in the ancient, or the state today, of Iraq is ancient Mesopotamia, um, and Sumer and Akkad, which we'll be talking about. And if you know anything about the climate of where our soldiers have been serving for so long, almost eight years now, almost, more, almost on the verge of nine years, it's a very desert. There's not a lot of arable land outside of the specific Tigris, Euphrates rivers. And yet they had complex irrigation for a large portion of this land, a whole population somewhere in the upwards of 100,000 people at some of these ancient capitals. One of the most significant events in human history, of course, they invented the first writing system called cuneiform. If you do a survey of people on the most significant accomplishments in human history, the invention of writing in this cuneiform that shows up from Sumeria initially, one of the top 10 most important human foundations we've ever had. If you're a Christian, Muslim, Jewish, you have heard these stories. They make up more than 60% of the world's population. The Garden of Eden, Noah's Ark, the three wise men, Daniel and the lion, Jonah and Abraham all come from Mesopotamia. So a significant in terms of our kind of cultural rhetoric that we have. The first story in humankind's history, Gilgamesh, which they are now making a modern motion picture starring Samuel L. Jackson. First legal code in human history, the Spell of Hammurabi coming out of Babylon, which we would cover in a later class. And one of the big kind of sticklers for me is this important one here. In your age category currently, as of last week, there were 4,446 American soldiers that have been died and have died in Iraq since 2003, since we began kind of um, op Operation Iraqi Freedom. So 4,446. Please keep it in mind when you think about that. We're talking about ancient Iraq in most kind of capitals that shows up here. Now, I always like to present an ethical dilemma. So here's the ethical dilemma I have for this part of the world. In our continued military engagement with Iraq, three American presidents, first George Bush, um, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, and second George Bush, both of them, three American presidents had to make a choice to either aerial bomb Iraq, potentially destroying ancient archaeological sites and saving American ground troops, or risking American ground troops' lives to save the ancient archaeological cities. 
The question I'd like you to ponder and think over with two or three partners around you is, what decision would you make and why? Consider such things as, what does this information that we could potentially gather from the ancient world say about all of humanity, not just America? And lay that against the potential aspects of losing American ground troops. Some of them who you may know, some of them who are maybe relatives of you that are serving overseas. And I give them an opportunity to think through that before we come back and talk about this kind of as an ethical question to set up and frame the experience that we're having. The next thing I like to do is like, like to give them an overview of some significant things that are going on in the area of world history that we may be covering to continue on. So when we look at Sumer from 2800 to 2300 BCE and Akkad 2300 to 2100 BCE, again we use BCE, I actually like to use that, it's before the Common Era, as many of our students do not know, rather than BC, before Christ trying to get rid of the Christian referent, even though it's the same date on a worldwide scale as we look, look through it. And two things that are going on concurrently with the development of southern Mesopotamia and Sumer and Akkad. One is the Great Pyramids at Giza. If you've ever been there, one of the most spectacular sites, most impressive sites in human history being developed during this time period during Sumer. And Akkad and Sumer both encompass Stonehenge in England 2750 to 1500 BCE. So some of the things that are going on in both prehistory before writing and in the written culture like what we have with Sumeria. Now there are four artworks I generally cover with Sumeria and Sumer. First one being the Nana Ziggurat, the moon goddess Ziggurat of Ur, and also talking about the Uruk vase of Uruk. So looking at two different variations of types, so architecture, and this is an alabaster stone um, low relief carving that we have here. The Nana Ziggurat, this is a religious temple. It's a temple that's dedicated to the moon goddess, built on the rubble of earlier temples as they get higher and higher, closer and closer to gods. Ancient stories from this time even talk about the gods on some level mounting as they go towards the heavens, climbing up these stairs, always with a temple on top. And a lot of the artwork that we have remaining today comes from these forms called ziggurats. Ziggurats, spelled right here for you. They're accumulated temples. And then we have the Rook vase, showing these narrative registers going across here. Again, wavy line for water that shows up. Different types of plants and animals. Naked priests bringing gifts, actually, to Inanna, one of the, the most important goddesses in this role as her fertility goddess, all the way across in low relief. Now, features of southern Mesopotamian art. This is true of Sumer and Akkad. We have called what's a hierarchic scale which basically means that larger figures receive the most important. They're larger in scale, they're larger in proportion than smaller figures. We have modern events that show up, particularly when we first see this shows up in Akkad, the later period we're talking about. We have narrative registers, these registers that tell the story going throughout the artwork. Simplified faces, and the most, one of the most important features is these attentive gazes, these eyes that stare into your soul. It was believed, in fact, that if you didn't look someone in the eye, you had malevolent, evil intentions. This is where we get the idea of the evil eye for someone who couldn't make eye contact with you while talking. In 3D sculpture, we have clothing that emphasizes the cylindrical body shape and low relief profile heads and legs and three quarter view torsos. Or in other words, the way that we see these things is that you have um, the face looking forward, the feet looking forward, and their torsos are often turned as we see this a lot later on in Egyptian art. There's very little difference between male and female bodies. And finally, in Sumer, religion reigns in terms of what we look at art. When we start looking at the Akkadian kind of city, state, and empire later on, it's much more of a political designation that we show up. And so that's what dominates. So I will do a visual thinking strategy of Sumer where I have them look at these votive statues from the square temple of Eshnana um, in Iraq. And they will be able to start to kind of figure out by looking in small group formats and then we have a larger conversation about how the eyes stare out, how important that is. 
the kind of prayer postures, the very upright postures, and the new feature of the cylindrical shape, which we wouldn't have seen in earlier prehistoric art. So some of the new things that come up. I will then also walk them through the great bull liar, talking about the narrative scene. And sometimes, depending on how well they do, I'll ask them to try to figure this out I'll kind of on their own, and we'll walk through what some of the different iconography and symbolism is. Or I'll ask them, from the features I gave you of ancient Mesopotamian art, what features are here and what features are absent? The other thing that I always like to do is give them first um, accounts or first uh, stories that they can actually read. And none better in this time period than the ep epic of Gilgamesh, the first story in humankind history allowed to be written because of cuneiform. And in each of these stories that I give them, what, one of the things I want to make sure that we hit are these four ideas are what, like, what I like to emphasize in the arts as we move forward up towards the Renaissance. How love and marriage are developed and change, the idea of death in the afterlife, interactions with the God, and the hero's journey. And here, in narrative register, coming very much across from ancient Mesopotamian art, it's a modern day comic strip that took the epic of Gilgamesh as their way of looking at it. Then I will move to Akkad, and I will talk about the Stel of Naramsin. Akkad becomes the giant city-state, the kind of imperial power then here from 2300 to 2100 BCE after the fall of Sumer by the Akkadian king that actually is able to take over them. This is the third Akkadian king then in one of his military exploits. And so this is called the Stella, which means standing stone or standing rock the Stella of Naramsin, and an alternative spelling that you may also find from Iraq. And what I would ask them to do then is find out what is the message of this artwork. By simply looking at this artwork, what can you tell about this artwork using both the ideas that we have from ancient Mesopotamian art and from what you know about looking at art as well. To make sure they understand this, I have them compare and contrast the similarities and differences between what traditional Sumerian art and the Akkadian art, which takes much of Sumerian concepts, but then moves it on into a slightly different form. And then finally, I go back to the features you see in contemporary art and culture, and I ask them in modern art, which of these art forms do you see, and how do you see these modern art forms develop? And that's kind of a presentation, kind of a pedagogical approach to teaching Southern Mesopotamia. Thank you very much. Again, my name is John Frazier from the College of DuPage. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at frazier at cod.edu. Thank you. Good luck in your studies.